Good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Diamond, Adult Services Coordinator at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you for joining us for Sparrows Point Woman of Steel. We're pleased to present tonight with the Baltimore Museum of Industry as we highlight the stories of these women in industry. I hope all of you will help spread the good news. We know you have been waiting patiently for the library to safely reopen. As of March 8th, the Pratt Library has reopened its doors for limited browsing and computer access. Our locations are operating at 25% capacity. And of course, the safety of everyone, customers and staff is a high priority. We also still have Wi-Fi hotspots available for checkout. So as you work or wind down, you can check out one of these for increased digital access. You can learn more about our current hours, how to check out hotspots, and so much more about our other services and virtual events at prattlibrary.org. Now it's my pleasure to pass it to the Baltimore Museum of Industry. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Bedard, a member of the Baltimore Museum of Industry's Board of Trustees. I am delighted to welcome all of you to today's program, program on Women of Steel. For those not familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we are located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We are dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. We're in the third year of our Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project, which seeks to preserve the 125-year history of the steelmaking giant in Baltimore. As part of this project, we, are curr we currently have an exhibition about women of steel up along our key highway fence. You are all invited to come take a look and hear from these pioneering women in the steel industry. Programs like this one are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you are currently a supporter, thank you. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org. Your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're looking forward to today. Support for today's program comes from the Baltimore chapter of NAWIC, the National Association of Women in Construction, in honor of Women in Construction Week, March 7th through the 13th. NAWIC advocates for the value of women builders professionals and tradeswomen in all aspects of the construction industry. Learn more about NAWIC's core purpose to strengthen and amplify the success of women in the construction industry at nawicbaltimore.org. Now, just a bit of, house, of housekeeping, your cameras and mics are turned off, but we encourage you to participate by asking a question in the chat or Q&A features. This program is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. Today's program is an example of how three unique organizations in the region can up our game and bring you even better programs by working together. We are so pleased to partner with the Osher Institute of Lifelong Learning at Towson University, as well as the Historical Society of Baltimore County to host this discussion. Now I'd like to hand the floor over to James Keffer. Hi, um, I'm the director of the Historical Society of Baltimore County. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I just wanted to welcome our members that are here today and let and introduce us to everyone else that might not know about the Historical Society of Baltimore County. If you have any interest in history in the county, preservation and telling the stories of, um, of all the great things that happened in the county, like, like the stories that we're gonna hear today, please come to our website and find out more about how you can join or support us as well. Um, and find out more programs and exhibits that we'll be doing. We are going to, our, our website is hsobc.org um, and you can find us on Facebook. Uh, we have a Smithsonian exhibit that's going to be opening in December um, called Voices and Votes, Democracy in America. We're gonna be host hosting a portion of that exhibit, um, the Smithsonian's portion of that exhibit at the CCBC Dundalk campus. And we're gonna be hosting a local part of that exhibit in uh, our building in the Historic Alms House in Cockeysville. So uh, watch for updates on that opening in December. And also this week on our website, we'll be having going up 
a um, Smithsonian poster show called Votes for Women, A Portrait of Persistence. Um, we actually have the posters in our building as well, but since we're not uh, having a lot of people in right now, uh, we're, we're making a web version that you can check out to see those on our website that should open this week. And um, I'm Tracy Jacobs. I'm the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Towson University. Uh, we offer non-credit courses, lectures, and other programming aimed at people who are 50 and older, uh, but we're open to all ages. Um, right now, due to COVID-19 restrictions, our spring semester courses are happening online via Zoom. Um, and we just started our semester um, last week, but if anybody's interested in uh, checking them out and um, you know, seeing if they want to still take some classes, still possible to sign up. Um, we actually have a class on the history of Sparrows Point, which is an eight-week course being taught by uh, labor scholar um, Bill Barry. Um, we don't have any prerequisites, tests, homeworks, or grading for any of our courses or lectures or anything. It's really just learning for the pure joy of learning. Um, and you can check us out at www.towson.edu slash OSHER. Um, I'm excited that we could be a part of today's program. And I'd like to introduce our discussion moderator, Michelle Stefano. Uh, Michelle is a folk life specialist at the American Folk Life Center in the Library of Congress. And um, previously she was a state folklorist for Maryland and a faculty member of the American Studies Department of UMBC. In late 2012, she began the Mill Stories Project with UMBC professor Bill Shoebridge, which focused on documenting the stories and memories of Sparrows Point workers after the mill's closure. In 2014, they co-produced the film Remembering Sparrows Point Steel Mill, based on video interviews with a wide range of former mill workers. And uh, you can find out more about that project and see the film's trailer on millstories.org. Thank you, here's Michelle. Thank you so much, Tracy, and hello everyone. Um, yeah, as part of the Mill Stories project, I was so lucky to be involved with interviewing around 35 former uh, workers at Sparrows Point. Nonetheless, I never had the pleasure to meet our panelists today during that project. Uh, and so I thought first uh, you would each introduce yourselves, perhaps talking a bit about the years that you were at Sparrows Point and um, maybe the first jobs you had. Uh, and then we'll get we'll dig deeper into that as we go along. But we'll first start out with Rita Hamlet and then we'll go to Sandy Adams Doyle and then Kathy Garrison. So please, Rita, tell us tell us about yourself. Well, my name is Rita and um I went down to take uh, my brother and my cousin down to Bethlehem Steel to apply for a job. And I seen these ladies coming up and I asked them, I said, Miss, uh, they hiring ladies? She said, they gonna start hiring. So I went there and I filled out an application and about two weeks later, they called me and I went down and they said, well, before we hire you, you're gonna have to gain 10 pounds. I said, gain 10 pounds. So I went back two weeks later and I had gained 7.4 pounds. So the man said, if you could gain seven pounds in two weeks, I'm gonna hire you because I know you'll gain the rest of the weight. But what the man didn't know was I put rocks in my bra, in my pocket and in my socks so I could gain weight, so I could be heavier, you know, but I didn't gain weight, you know, so, you know, and they hired me. And I don't know if y'all know about Stevie Wonder, but when I got down there, it was like skyscrapers and everything. Oh my God, what in the world could you do down here? What, what is going on? And the first place I started, it was on the ore dock. The ore dock, ships came in and brought iron ore, you know, and we was to get it off and place it where it had to go and and one day they said, uh, Rita, you got to go down in this hole. It was 100 feet deep and two blocks long. Well, where is the hole? I'm looking for a little hole to climb down in, you know. And, and I went with other guys and then getting out, 
they swing their leg over and come on out. I couldn't get my leg to go up there. So they would grab me by the back of my shirt, the back of my pants and pull me out, you know, and it was a learning. It was learning. I was going to quit every week. I was quitting that job. And I would say, wait a minute, stay and send your kids to summer camp. Then I'm going to quit. Then I say, wait a minute, get them some school clothes, then quit. Then I say, wait a minute, buy them some Christmas stuff, then quit. Then my children grew up and was gone. I said, why do you still go to that job? I said, because you got to eat, dummy. Don't forget, you got to eat. And I stayed there. And I stayed. And today, I'm thankful that I stayed. You know, so it was just, I went from one department to another, to another, to another. Even the guy said, would you wanted a man's job. I said, what is wrong with you? I'm sitting, sitting around for your wife, your children, your grandchildren. If, so I went home crying, daddy. They said I wanted a man's job. I came back to work. And the next time they said that, I said, excuse me, sir. I wanted a man's paycheck. And since I couldn't get you to give me your own, I came and got my own, you know, and I stuck and stayed. And I'm going to tell you, they paid more back in the 70s than they paying people today. I'm so happy that I had enough sense to stick and stay that some people would tell me, some guys would say, I said, I'm scared to go up there. He said, Rita, don't focus on the up or the down. Just go and do what you have to do. Don't look down. Don't look up. Just Stay focused on what you have to do. And that's what I had to do. And guess what? Today, I'm thankful that I stayed there. I'm thankful for my pension and I'm thankful for my social security checks. Come on, Miss Sandy. Okay. Hi, I'm Sandy Adams Doyle. Can you hear me? I can. You can hear me? Okay. Um, I have a, a little bit different story. I graduated from Sparrows Point High School and went to college. And I did some professional sales for a couple of years. And although I was successful at it, it just wasn't fulfilling. And so I thought, well, Bethlehem Steel's hiring women. And I've always been really handy with my dad, helping him fix things. And so I went down and I took the tool test and you could hear people in the HR de department running around yelling, we got a girl who passed the tool test. We got a girl who passed the tool test. So I became a millwright's apprentice and it was a big blow to my dad. He had worked at Bethlehem Steel for 31 years. And when I stopped by his house to tell him the good news, he was like, I didn't put you through college to go down there and work. You're going to get dirty. Go in there and change your clothes because you'll see how dirty you get. And I had to change the oil in the car and get in the crawl space and do a bunch of things. And he said, now, when you go, do not let those guys, they're going to pull your chain. They're going to send you for a three-way valve and not tell you what size. And you'll have to walk across the plant to get this part. So make sure you find out the size. He said, and then they'll send you for make-believe things like sky hooks. And so rolled around, it was my day to start work. And my father had one of those metal lunch boxes and he gave me his lunch box. And inside the lunch box was an encyclopedia of tools. And he said, you're gonna to need to know all your tools and the proper way to use them. So I, uh, you know, a, a little begrudgingly because there weren't many women who were uh, millwrights apprentice. There was an older guy in the gang. We, we sat in a place called the pit and there was a table and that's where we had our lunch and, and all. And I started to work in the Coke ovens and the Coke ovens are super, super hot. So uh, a millwright is um, an industrial mechanic. So they work on the equipment. They keep production going because they, um, they fix things. And I always like to fix things. This was probably about 1979. 
I think. And um, so I had this book and when I ate my lunch in the pit, underneath the table, I'd read about the tool I had used. And, you know, a couple weeks went by and somebody said, oh, Sandy, what are you reading? And I said, nothing, nothing, you know, and they grabbed the book and they said, oh, look what Sandy's reading. She's got a tool encyclopedia. So I grabbed it and put it back in my lunchbox, a little embarrassed, but um, a couple weeks later, we had to fix this hydraulic line on a, on a uh, Coke pusher. Now in the Coke ovens, what happens there is they load coal and they heat it to a really high temperature without any oxygen. And then it becomes Coke. And that's what, that's what you, is used as fuel in the blast furnace. So they have this big piece of equipment that pushes through the oven and pushes the Coke out and it was broken. Well, the tool shop, they, they checked out a tube bender in the tool shop, but no one could figure out how to put it together. So what do they say? Sandy, go get your book. <laughs> and so I got my book and read to them how to put it together. And we were successful at fixing this hydraulic line. Every day it was something different and it was um, incredibly stimulating. It was hot. If you had to go up on the top of the Coke ovens, you had to put these wooden shoes underneath your steel-toed boots. And I started in August. And so you had the fireproof clothing, you had all that gear. It was pretty dirty, pretty hot, and pretty miserable. But I totally look forward to going to work. I especially love to spend um, downtime burning steel. and. What that is, we would have these plates of steel that were like an inch thick, and you would fire up this torch with all the safety equipment and all, and I could actually, through this big plate of steel, burn my name or make squares, and they called me often to do that because they said women had a steady hand to be able to do um, that type of work. So it was very interesting. I, I unfortunately, I, after a few months, I got laid off and um, I began a career at Johns Hopkins. And so when they called me back, I chose to stay at Johns Hopkins. Not because it was more money, because when you worked at Bethlehem Steel, boy, that paycheck was really nice. So, okay, Kathy, you're up. Hi, uh, my name is Kathy Garrison. I started in 1976 and I was there for I started in number four over her in the steel making department. I was there for 36, almost 37 years. And I left when the company went, when they sold the company. But um, I started out in the steel making labor gang and, um, and I was in the open hearth. And uh, it was, it was, it was like, I felt like someone had dropped me off in the land of the giants because my first couple of days there, I couldn't get over how big everything was. And it was, it was an experience. They, they, I don't think they were really prepared for women there because they didn't even have a woman's bathroom in the mill, in the open hearth. And uh, it was, uh, it was definitely um, an eye opener, but it was very exciting job. It was scary. There were a lot of uh, machinery and I mean, just imagine it was almost like being in a, in a circus and you've got all these different rings and, you know, with all these different activities going on. There were cranes in the sky. There were, you know, in the air. I mean, the mills were probably, I don't know how tall they were, but I would venture to say they were probably at least a hundred foot tall, you know, the mills and uh, they had trucks with tires that were, that were bigger than me carrying these great big dump trucks with hot rock and they would roar by you. And it was, it was pretty amazing. And, uh, but when I, when I went down there, I actually, I didn't have dreams of being a steel worker when I was a little girl. I just, um, grew up in, in, in right in Edgemere in a little town right next to the mill on Jones Creek. And everybody worked down there, just about everybody. And if you didn't work there, um, you work in some fashion support of, in support of, of the mill. Um, 
normally um, just about everybody on my street worked there. And, um, and I grew up listening to the sound. You could hear, you could see the silhouette of the steel mill from my back door and you could, um, you could hear the sounds. And I always wondered, you know, but my first day at work, I can remember going, oh, that's what that is. That's what that noise is, you know, but uh, it was, it was definitely an experience. Thank you all for those really rich uh, introductions. I hope to go back a little and, and, and learn a little bit more about your experiences, including the challenges uh, you each face. And I just want to say for everyone joining us, I will be asking a series of questions to our three panelists until about maybe 2.35 around there. And then we will be opening it up to all of your questions so you can continue to put those uh, in the chat that you'd like to ask each of our distinguished uh, guests here today. Um, yeah, so just to give a little brief overview of women at Sparrows Point, that story does go back to the early 20th century, mainly the 1920s when women worked as what they called tin floppers, inspecting sheets of tin that were produced at the mill, Bethlehem Steel as it was called at that time and for the majority of its life. Uh, and women worked in offices you know, office jobs, uh, as well as clerks, uh, particularly after the, the post-war boom, uh, the height of Sparrows Point as the biggest steel mill in the world. But it really wasn't until uh, the late 1970s, after the 1974 consent decree, which uh, attempted to end racial discrimination in terms of hiring and promotion uh, at the mill, that that really ushered in this second wave, if you will, of of women workers in all sorts of jobs like we've just heard. So um, I'd like to ask a little bit about that. Take us back into the late 1970s. Um, you know, so, uh, I know some of you were the first women in the positions uh, that you had. Um, maybe, you know, describe a bit of what it was like. Obviously it was a male dominated world. Uh, and in terms of discrimination, I know from just talking with other women steel workers in, in the projects I've been in, involved in, um, there was sexual harassment. Um, there was even loads of pornography up on the walls. Um, and, and yet there was this big need to prove uh, that you could do those, the jobs, the man's job. So I'd love to open that up. Maybe we'll start with Rita just talking about what it was like back in, you know, those first years and days, however you want to describe it at the mill. You know, I worked in the department, you know, when uh... When you coat in the steel, when you coat in slabs with the steel, when it the uh, when it stopped moving, it would blow all over the place upstairs. So the foreman said, Hamlet, I want you to go up there and I want you to fill up three trash bags. So when you try to pick it up, it's blowing all over the place. I couldn't pick it up. And I looked around, I said, how am I gonna pick it up? And it, it would breeze all, you couldn't even get it. it. Wouldn't go on the shovel, it couldn't. So I seen the water line, I seen a long pipe. I turned the water line on, held the pipe to it, and I watered it down. Then I opened up bags and I filled up the bags. I filled up 15 bags. And I went back downstairs and sit in the room and they said, Hamlet, if you didn't fill up three bags, we're sending you home. I said, I didn't fill them up. And he came back down the steps and the foreman said, Hamlet, go here to the showers. Don't even worry about punching out. I got you. And the guy said, what? He said, she filled up 15 bags. They said, how did you do that? I said, what, y'all need a woman to tell y'all everything? And I just kept on walking, you know. And uh, it was just like... I, I had to prove myself. You know, the foreman said, Rita, you working with him. Whatever he do, you do. He jumped up and ran up the steps. I jumped up and ran behind him. And he said, what's the matter? I said, I don't know. The foreman said, do whatever you do. He said, this is how I get my exercise in. Well, I was running up the steps. He said, you're the first person that ever did that, that ran behind him. Okay, really? All right. So, you know, one time the foreman said the lights had went out and he said, Hamlet, put a bulb in there. I said, no, because I'm not an electrician. That's not my job. 
Uh-uh, I'm, not, I'm not putting no bulb in there. That's not my job. He went and got a bulb and put it in there and fuck, started flying and all like that. I said, yeah, right. That's why we got electricians. I don't, I ain't put no bulb in there. And see, then I had left the ore dock and I had went to the coal sheet mill. And, you know, it was like in the labor gang, you know, wherever was yellow stripes, that's where you could walk. It would be safe. And that was my job. So I would go get gloves and put them on, pour bleach in the thing and wipe the yellow bars down and sweep up and all like that. And they said, well, we know who was here today, Hamlet. And you sit on the steps and the steps were like grates. And I'd sit out there and I'd pluck the cigarette butts from out the holes and all like that. And and uh, the foreman came up one day. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting the cigarette butts from out. He said, well, you have to clean. The I said, I've already done all of that. I've already cleaned the, the bathrooms, wiped the windows down. I had already did all of that. And he offered me a job, said his wife needed somebody to come to their home and help her clean the house. So I said, mister, I got five children and a husband. When I go home, I have to go home and feed my five children and my husband. I don't have time to go help you. Do. I will clean up his office, water the plants, dump the trash, did everything. Because where I came from, where I grew up at, believe me, we had to clean up every morning before we left out the door. I thought my mother was crazy. Why you got to clean? Who ain't? I said, Mom, my girlfriends, they only clean up on the weekend. She said, good, go move in with them. And then you won't have to clean up it on the weekend. So when I got there, I already knew what to do, you know, I already knew what to do and keep it moving, you know, but it, it was hard. It was hard on a woman and they were very prejudiced. And I don't mean just the Caucasians, even the black guys was prejudiced against me, saying stuff like, you know, and I would go home feeling bad. And, but when I tell my father, I told you all a story, but it wasn't the whole story about I couldn't get a man's paycheck, so I came and got my own. No, I left out all the cuss words. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, because I got 15 grandchildren and 18 greats, and I just showed them how to get on, you know, to come on. So they don't, don't want to hear granny. Uh, they call me Gigi. They don't want to hear Gigi using them words, you know. So, you know, but I stuck and stayed. And, you know, when, when I retired, I was glad to retire. Then I started missing my job. I started missing the friends I had made down there. And, you know, once a year, we would all go up to the Golden Corral and everybody would meet and, and you know, and stuff like that. And we would go down um, for where the union was and pass out food and stuff like that. It just seemed like, man, I just miss all that stuff. I miss it, but I got some friends' numbers that I... Like, I called three people this morning. Don't y'all forget to zoom in. You know, I called them, but I send out about 40 texts to all my family. And, and the lady sent my daughter, uh, like, her email. And she would send it out to other people and send you the picture and you press it. And, you know, I said, I don't know what to do with this stuff. You know, so I just showed up. So, But my daughter said, Ma, we could have did it at home. Yeah, I know y'all good, but... All I want was a telephone answer, and maybe I would text somebody back now and then. They want to watch movies, listen to the radio. I don't want to hear all that on my phone. So, you know, we'll keep this circle moving. Come on. Come on, Miss Sandy. Okay. So <laughs> um, I, want, I want to step back just a little bit because um, I my husband... Uh, often says that I should have been an engineer. I was really good with math in school. But at the time in the 70s, um, no one in my family had gone to college. And my father assumed early on before I went to college that I would just maybe be a secretary down at the mill. And the thing I regret, I guess, is there were no role models in my life to guide me in a, in a direction that perhaps would have allowed me to become a professional engineer. I mean, I've, I really loved working with my hands. I loved um, designing stuff. So all of those things and the math would have fit perfectly to become some type of engineer. 
Um, but anyway, going back to Bethlehem Steel, the group that I worked in, it was a very small group. It was maybe five or uh, six men. And there was an older man there that I think I reminded him of his daughter. And so he protected me. So I, I didn't get ridiculed a lot. I didn't get taken advantage of. Uh, he, he sort of looked out for me. Although, uh, you know, the Women were definitely treated differently. Um, you know, do you need a break? Sometimes I, I would hear. But the one thing that um, encouraged me that meant I was sort of part of their group was when they invited me to come have, I forget what they called it, a wing ding or something at Mickey's. Mm. They At Mickey's, they sold those beers in those court containers. And, you know, I would hear their stories about stopping there after work, but I was never invited. And then finally, I was invited to stop and, and have a beer with them. The other thing I have to say about that group, there, you know, they would have some downtime. And these men would read the paper from front to back. They were incredibly intelligent. They politically were savvy. They knew what was going on, not only locally, but nationally. And I had incredible respect for them. So um, although my tenure was short there, it was um, interesting. And of course, I, I never ran into another woman while I worked there. So, okay, Kathy, you're up. Well, as far as... Um... The, the discrimination, the attitude towards the women at first was, uh, I think they thought we were a novelty, that nobody, no woman would want to, where I was at in the open group. Like I said, there were um, women that worked in the tin mills and women in other parts of the mill, but where I, when I went into the open group, there, um, there weren't any women. It was very hot there, very dangerous, and uh, for some reason, they just never brought women into there until the consent degree came through, but um, I, got, I, I got a lot of um, comments, like um, it was almost embarrassing in a way because, um, or they made you try to feel, make, try to make you feel guilty. Most of them were very supportive, but some of them would say, um, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Uh, you should be home taking care of your baby because I did have a baby at the time. And um, you're taking a good job away from a man. And, uh, you know, the man's trying to support his family and you're taking these jobs away. And what's the matter with you? You know, like, and it, it didn't just come from the people in the mill. It came from people outside the mill, like other women that would go, oh, I would never work there. That place is so filthy, you know. But I always had a good comeback. Like I said, if money buys a lot of soap. <laughs> and, uh, like, for the guys that would say, uh, you, you know, you should be at home with your kids. Um, I would say, so should you, you know? They'd say, this is too dangerous a place for a woman. Well, it's too dangerous of a place for anybody, really. This is just as dangerous for you. I mean, is your life worth any, more, more, any less than my life, you know? And if it wasn't for, um, if, if it wasn't me working here, it would be another woman. They would hire another woman in my place because the government says you have to, hire so many women. I, I don't know what, not sure, I think it was like 25% had to be minority um, because of the consent degree. So um, I did feel a little guilty at first, um, just because back in, even back in the, uh, in the 70s, in the early 70s, people had very defined roles, like in my, in my neighborhood. I mean, the men were the, were the providers. And most of the women in my neighborhood were all where I grew up were homemakers, you know, and that was your job. And it was a full-time job to take care of your home and take care of your family. And the husband went out and made the money. And uh, if you, you know, that was, that was just the way that it was. My, my husband, I was married at the time. My husband didn't really want me to work there. I kind of had to beg him, <laughs> you know, let me work there because I, I, you know, I really wanted to, wanted us to buy a home and, you know, and, and be able to, to, to get, get things quicker. And, um, but, you know, I, I mean, <coughs> after a while, I, I became 
you know, kind of, um, I developed like an edge to me. And once, once I think once, for, for the most part, people were very supportive. Um, then you had those ones that would make the smart remarks, you know, and, and um, this one guy who was an older guy, he, um, he would never talk to me. And I couldn't understand why he was, you know, why he was so just seemed so angry with me all the time. He was just, you know, just was very, um, very sh short and, you know, and I asked one of the guys, I said, what is wrong with him? He said, well, he's mad because he spent all that money to send his daughter to college and you're down here making more money than her, you know? And, and you know, he spent a lot of money to send his daughter to college. Like I was supposed to apologize for that or something. <laughs> I was just there, you know, trying to make a living for my family, just like everybody else. Um, and, you know, it's just, I was willing to kind of like put up with the danger and the, but you know, the one thing that I can say is when you earn the respect, once you earn their respect, you know, then all of that, you know, then they're very, very supportive. And we become, we became like some, some of the people that I worked down there with were, I was very close to, and we were very, we were like family. And, um, so when the, when the mill, like many years later, when the mill finally did close, it was like a death, you know, because I mean, it was people you had worked with your whole life and you watched their kids grow up and, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of sad, but in the earlier days, I just kind of like would just quit back to them and just say, you know, so something smart, <laughs> there were a lot of naked pictures and, and um, a lot of remarks, like you'd be walking along and you'd hear one of the guys say, look, there goes one, like you're some kind of a bug or something. Um, you know, it, I don't think that any of them really thought in the beginning that the women would last, but, um, you know, we did. Yeah, and you not only lasted, you became the chair of the Women of Steel much later, yes. The last decade of, of the mill's life. Um, perhaps uh, I would love to ask about the balance of raising a family uh, and work, because even to this day, that burden of, of raising family is still on women, and yet we're out in the workforce. Um, but if you would like to also talk about the union, because we're getting a couple questions on, on your involvement in the, in the union, and, and of course the beginnings of the Women of Steel group and what you did for that group, Kathy? Well, they had, um, like in the earlier years, I, to be honest with you, I didn't, um, I wasn't a real, um, I didn't, my, my, I felt like, like I had said before, I felt like somebody had given me the golden key to the boys clubhouse. And all I had to do was just go to work, do my job, do what I had to do and go home. And, you know, I wasn't going to start start any fuss and I wasn't going to tell them to take their pictures down or, you know, I was, it was very clearly a man's world in the very, you know, in the very beginning, especially, I mean, there were naked pictures everywhere and the guys weren't used to working with women. I mean, in the open work, they weren't, they, they still had a, like, they would forget and they would urinate on the side of the wall and you'd be walking on your, oh, geez, be, oh, I'm sorry. Cause they, they had, that had always been the norm for them. They, you know, they just, it wasn't like they were trying to be disrespectful. They just would forget that there were women there. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't really say anything about the, the pictures or anything because I knew that if I did, they would get rid of me. They would find a way to fire me or they say she's not working out or, you know, send her off to some other mill or, you know, so I figured the less fuss I made and, and you know, I just go to work, do my job and go home and try to prove myself and try to earn their respect, which, you know, um, which eventually they came to realize, you know, she's, they would laugh at, she's one of the boys, you know, but um, I didn't really, in the early years, like I said, I kind of disconnected. I didn't get involved with the union because it wasn't, you know, it was just like, go to work, come home, go to work, come home. And then later on when I did, I realized how important it was. The union was, you know, was a tremendous, um, it was a way for women to connect and a lot of women disconnected. You didn't get, you didn't really, 
a lot of them didn't really, some of them did, but a lot of them didn't get invited to the bar after work, like, you know, or um, didn't get in, you know, wasn't included in some of the talk. And there was a lot of information that because women were so disconnected that, um, that we weren't getting. And, you know, so when I got involved, I was asked by the union if I would, um, if I would chair the Women of Steel and they had, they had had a Women of Steel because Addie Smith was, they did wonderful things with Women of Steel. But for some reason, I think when, when the financial problems and then, you know, Bethlehem was going to go bankrupt, that kind of like fell by the wayside and it, it kind of, they, they kind of, you know, stopped concentrating on, um, on trying to keep that going because they, they were just looking at the survival of the plant. And um, so then, um, they came to me and asked me, um, if I would be interested in sharing the women of steel. And I really was like, I'm not, you know, cause I wasn't really very active in the union. I think I had maybe been to one or two union meetings or something like that. You only went to the union meetings when something terrible was going on or they told you to come because the plant was getting ready to shut down or something. And, um, I didn't realize how much information I was missing and how disconnected I was. And so... Yeah, we, we, we um, kind of, um, the, the local union president said, well, I'm going to send you to Blacksburg, Virginia, and to a Women of Steel training course. It's a women's leadership course. And so you can find out. Matter of fact, I asked, what is it all about? And, and most people said, I don't know. We don't know, you know. And uh, so they sent me down there, and I learned what it was about. And we come back, and we kind of, like, tried to revitalize the um the women's steel program and we had you know we had a lot of women coming to the meetings and stuff and and uh but it was a way for us to all connect and us to network together you know because you know a lot of women did disconnect they just as far as like um the work-life balance and that sort of thing i think the shift work was the worst as far as that goes because um i worked for the first probably 20 years, I worked a 21 turn violate the schedule. They called it a 21 turn violate schedule, but it was like you work two, you work three shifts in one week. You work two 11 to seven, two three 11s and a daylight and you work two daylights. It was just horrendous. And when you've got children, especially like when you worked three in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night, if you had kids in school, you didn't get to see your kids at all. I mean, you know, they would be in bed when you got home and when you woke up in the morning, it was like, you know, hurry, hurry. And they were off to school. So it was like, and sometimes I would come home from work and wake them up <laughs> just so I could see them for a little bit, you know. But um, it was, um, I think the shift work was the hardest, just trying to adjust to that. And, and uh, you know, trying to, to, to the constant flipping. There's no consistency in your life. And, and, uh, but believe it or not, I mean, you do get used to it after a while. Um, and then later on, in the, the last um, five or six years, I was a safety trainer, so I worked all daylight. And of course, by then my kids were all grown. But you know, but uh, you know, it was um, it's a lot of challenges. But it's but you know, it's amazing what you can adjust to. And um, as far as the women of steel goes, I think it was, um, and the union played a paramount part in keeping people, you know, trying to keep people um informed and connected with each other and you know and women of steel i think kind of teaches you to lean in and to tell you know ask for what you need or ask for what you want because a lot of women don't didn't do that they would just sit back and you know like some of the gloves they had you would feel like edward scissor hands you know what i mean big gloves that were meant for bigger men you know and you um you know, a lot of women wouldn't, wouldn't say, could you order me some smaller gloves? But, um, you know, and you can't expect people to just assume that you need that or, or, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to speak up and, you know, and there are, you know, there are different, it, 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 it was really, really valuable in the sense that women started, you know, there were some women that were st involved. There were women that held, um, positions in the union, high positions, you know, and uh, it wasn't like everybody was, women, all women were totally disconnected, but a lot of them just didn't see the importance of it, and um, 
And once you once you see what you're missing, you see what you're missing. <laughs> but until right. that, right. you don't even know. You know? So yeah. Well, I was wondering, Rita or Sandy, your experiences with the work life balance, raising children, even at Hopkins, Sandy. Uh, but and uh, if you want to speak about the union or just want to open it up and then we'll go to the questions that are coming in, it looks like. Let me say this. When I first started down there, I was told we're not having no women working here. So we're not calling you Rita, we're calling you Frankie. And to the day, some of my workers, my friends still call me Frankie. Hey, Frankie. But I'm going to tell you some things that the union did for me. I was laid off when I came back to work. They had hired like two different people. And they were getting a vacation time, but I wasn't. I said, well, wait a minute. How come I got eight years and they just got hired? How could I be laid off and you hired some new people? Wasn't you supposed to call me back first? I went to the union on that and they had to give me my vacation and they had to pay me for paying the person for the time that I was out. And one other time I went to the union because I had left, the, I, I joined the, where I was a metallurgist and the state came in and said, tell me, do you know your job? I said, yeah. They said, well, tell it to me in the shortest terms. I said, it's to make it perfect and ship it out on time. So, you know, we tested it. It would tell you what was missing, what needed to be put in, what was the temperature. So if the temperature was 400 degrees, I would make it 420 degrees. So by the time they came and got it and shipped it out, it would be the perfect temperature like that. And, um, you know, one time, uh, I noticed I had to call the union because first they said uh, they couldn't take me into the metallurgist department because why? It's a, a guy working there that got less time than me. How could he work there and I not work there? Just because I'm a female and he's a male, I had to go call the union in on that one, you know? And I remember when they sent us away to hear the union meetings and they would ask people like how much they was making and they was making like 30,000 and 35,000. And by then we was making like 55,000, you know? And it was like, wow, y'all make all that, you know? So, you know, it was so much stuff going on but I would just call the union every time. And one time um, the union man said, that he couldn't help me. So I brought me a bus ticket and I went to the main union hall up in Pennsylvania. And I went in and I told him what was going on. And the lady said, well, we get ready to close so you have to come back tomorrow. I said, well, you might as well close the union office down and just let me sleep on the sofa because I don't have anywhere to go. I'm from Baltimore. So they gave me a thing to go I could check into the hotel, then I could eat, and they open up the next day at nine o'clock. Well, I was sitting on the steps at quarter after eight to make sure when I got there. And I, and I told them, how could they hire people and I'm laid off? What? I didn't understand that. So they gave me a letter and told me to take it back to the union. And when I brought it back down, down, down to the union hall, the, the guy said, did you read the letter? I said, no, because it was sealed. I wasn't, if he wanted me to read it, why would he seal it? You know, I wasn't going to open it. And he said, oh, I want you to read it. And the guy, what he wrote in there, he said, I want you to do everything possible to get our sister her job back. You know, and then I got my job back. And they didn't send me back to my department. They said that my department didn't want me. I said, they didn't want me. I didn't understand that. And so about three weeks later, they said, Hamlet, report back to your department. I said, I thought y'all didn't want me. They said, we didn't even know you was back until we saw you at Mickey's. We didn't even know you had came back to work. I went and got the union on them again. How are they going to not send me back to my department and gave me a written statement saying that my department didn't want me back. Same man who screwed the light bulb in. You know, 
for, I don't know what it was, but some reason I just don't think he liked women or he didn't want no woman on his job. I don't, I really don't know what it was, you know, but I was never afraid to stand up and speak up for myself, you know, so the union did real good for as far as I'm concerned. They fought for me when I ran, every time I would run to them, they fought for me. You know, I would call them and tell them what was going on and stuff like that. So, you know, you had to stand up for yourself. And believe me, I've, I've, I've faced a lot of things that I faced them anyway. You know, so I had to keep going because I had five children and a sick husband. If I went, when they hired me, I was working for uh, the telephone company. It was called CMP, the phone company. Bethlehem still took out more taxes than the CMP phone company paid me. They took out more taxes. So, no, I'm going to stay here because when I got my paycheck, it was like, oh boy, my pay in a vacation check. You know, they started with getting 13 weeks vacation. Then they went down later on, like four or five years later, you could get six weeks vacation and not 13 weeks. But that's all right, six weeks vacation. I could be off a month and a half. Or I would take it a month here, a week here, a week there. You know, I could take off six weeks vacation. You know, I, hey, I love my job. And now I, mi I have been missing my job because I've been gone for 16 years. And like when they hired me, I was 26. When I left there, I was 58. I've been gone. I don't know how long I've been gone, but I, this year I'm going to be 77. I want my job back, you know, but I know they shut down and they said that the union or somebody owed the workers something 13 million, $33 million. And as long as they stayed open, they had to pay them. And I think that's why they shut down. I'm not sure. It's just something that I heard that's what happened. I don't know if that's what happened or not. But then I know they saw selling the parts. And they made millions selling the parts, breaking them down, selling them. So I felt like, why didn't they just keep rolling and keep bringing the money in and paying it off? But I don't know. If I was the president of the union, we'd still be here. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Come on, Miss Sandy. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Sandy, would you like to add or? Uh, um... I would just say that, you know, when I started at Hopkins, I guess it was 1980, and um, after you were there for a year, you got a considerable amount of uh, vacation time, and you, and you had sick time, but you were never, ever allowed to call in sick because your child was sick. They would tell you, you need to be bleeding in the hospital to call in sick. It was, you know, it was uh, very challenging raising children. And I think even today, it's difficult for women who are professionals or have a full-time job. Uh, and the biggest thing for me is I had family support. And prior to starting our, our little panel discussion here, uh, I was talking with Kathy because I still live in Spares Point. My um, zip code is 21219. And we often know everyone, it, it, either our parents work together or our, uh, we went to high school together. I mean, my daughter went to Spares Point High School and the parents that sat on the bleachers at the sports games were people I graduated high school with. And so my parents lived a half a mile from us. And when it was difficult to have a sick child at Hopkins, I could um, depend on my parents to help me out. And I think that, you know, I call this community a one stoplight town. And it's still very much like a little Eastern shore town where we know each other, we help each other. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of crime down here. And most of us are a product of Bethlehem Steel. I mean, my, my father's husband, I mean, my, my husband's father, he worked at Bethlehem Steel. My dad worked at Bethlehem Steel. All of his brothers worked at Bethlehem Steel, like Kathy said. 
everyone we knew. And it was kind of funny when um, Kathy said something about the gentleman. He was a little angry because he had, he had sent his daughter to college and these people were making more money. Because when I um, started to work at Hopkins and my husband was a new employee at Baltimore Gas and Electric, the people we had graduated with had big boats and nice cars and, and all because the, the, the steel mill paid quite a bit more than, than we were making. So um, it's, I know that it's been very sad for people when the mill closed and, um, and I don't think it was because it disrupted their lifestyle as much as it just um, upset something that they had known for so long and had been comfortable with. So, I mean, my father retired with 31 years. Craig's father had 33 years. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. In that day and age, it was like you planted a seed and you grew with the company and you became part of the company. And fortunately for me, that happened for me at Hopkins. I had 35 years at Hopkins. But nowadays, and, and not just this younger generation, but in a five-year period, they may have three different jobs. And so that longevity that was offered to those at Buffalo Steel or institutions like Hopkins, it doesn't exist any longer. Um, uh, you know, product of technology, of becoming a, um, uh, rather than a manufacturing uh, society, we've become more of an intellectual property society, service society. So uh, just times are changed, but boy, it's fun to remember. Well, we're getting up there with the time. So I do want to make sure I'm uh, asking some of the questions that have come in from our audience. One is a rather interesting one and I'll throw it out to whoever would want to answer. Um, it's about the safety of the jobs and, and health issues. So uh, Susan asks, did any of you get any education about the health effects of breathing the air in the areas you worked. She visited the Coke oven area once and she says even just being near them, the odor was overwhelming. So anything about uh, that, knowing about the, the possible dangers? So uh, I, would, I would just jump in very quickly. It was horrific and potentially a reason why I didn't go back there. There was a gentleman, he would go over to this spout that just, put out these fumes. And if he had a nasal congestion or whatever, he would stick his nose up there and say, oh, clears it out. And, you know, I often wonder what happened to him. And, you know, it's it, it was a, a, a really scary place as far as carcinogens. I mean, and living in the community here, our snow early on when I was a kid, our snow would be red. I mean, it would be white when it came down, but it was red after a day or so because of the air pollution. Uh, that's it for me. Yeah. Well, Kathy, Rita, did you have any uh, education when you first got there or at some point? Um, they, they uh, in the in the earlier years, yeah, they they were, you know, they would give you safety equipment. And they they told you about the, the safety and told you what to look out for and they always wanted you to have someone with you like you know and that sort of thing um but OSHA played a big part and in, and in, in pushing the safety issue and and you know requiring that they that they uh that they you know do a better job safety it, a lot of those safety regulations are um are written in blood and there was a lot of people killed down there and it was very common it wasn't like um, like you were shocked by it because it, it you know, it, it was uh, the sort of thing where they say, oh, somebody over in Hot Mill got killed today. Somebody in the pickler got killed today. Somebody, in, you know, an electrician that got killed. And, you know, it's, it's very sad, but it was, it was, uh, you know, it was very uh, way, way, way too common. But um, so you knew, and you knew, you know, to, you didn't, you know, wear your safety helmet, you didn't wear your helmet because they told you to, you wore it because you knew, you know, if you didn't anything at any time could fall from the sky, from the crane and hit you in the head or whatever like that. Um, 
and everybody and everybody looked out for each other. It was almost like being um, like in the service or or you know where everybody kind of you know we all were very very protective of each other. You know you didn't want to see anybody. Um, you took it very personal when somebody that you work with got hurt. You know, so, but um, yeah, and and it, as time went on, I think environmentally they became a lot more aware. But in the earlier years, um, you were desensitized to it if you lived in the neighborhood because you know it was just part of the landscape. I mean, the red ore dust and all that—that that was like you knew see somebody's car with red ore dust all over it, you're like, oh, they work at Bethlehem Steel. You didn't think about ooh or anything like that. You just, you know, that was just the way things were. And then as environmental um, restrictions came about, the air quality finally got better. And, you know, and but the process of steel is a, is a, is a dirty, dirty. And I think that that was one of their, part of their demise because they just really couldn't meet the environmental standards and right. they spent millions and millions and millions of dollars and just, yeah, just couldn't. Yeah, there were a range of factors that led to its decline for sure. Unfortunately, we've made it to three o'clock, believe it or not. We could go for hours, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm turning it over to you, Chris, or? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you Thank all you for everyone. us today. That was, it was really inspiring to hear your story. So I personally thank you for you know, paving the way for many women to come. So thanks, thanks again. So thanks everyone online for joining us today. Just as a reminder, I mean, as COVID continues to impact so many facets of our work life, the museum's mission is especially relevant to the night. We hope that you will consider supporting the BMI so that the museum can continue to serve as a vital community resource. Thanks again to our panelists and to uh, Michelle and Tracy and James. We really appreciate the time and it was really fun. Thank you, well done. I'm Mona Isawi, a member of the Baltimore Museum of Industries Board of Trustees. I'm delighted to welcome all of you this evening uh, for the, our program. We are so pleased to partner with the Enoch Pratt Free Library to host uh, this discussion. And it's programs like this one uh, that are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you are currently a supporter, thank you very much. And if you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org. Uh, your support will help ensure that we continue to engage people in important conversations, just like the one that we're looking forward to have tonight. I am very pleased to welcome tonight's special guest, Aaron Henkin. Aaron is the producer of, uh, of the blocks and director of new local programming at Baltimore's NPR affiliate WYPR. Aaron's stories have aired nationally on NPR's uh, Morning Edition, All Things Considered, PRI Studio 360, and the world. His neighborhood documentary series, Out of the Blocks, has earned the 2018 National Edward Murrow Award. Aaron produced the new limited edition podcast, Sparrow's Point, an American Film Story, which is the foundation for this discussion. So Aaron, please take it away. Thank you so much, Muna. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to hop on here for a minute and uh, put this podcast on your radar. Um, if you want to dive a little deeper into the history of the mill, I really do hope you'll uh, check out this six-part series that I produced in partnership with the Baltimore Museum of Industry. It's called Sparrow's Point, an American Steel Story. And I'm going to play just a few quick audio clips uh, from it here to give you a sense of what it's all about. Episode one is really designed to kind of get you into the story with a listener immersion experience where you get to hear firsthand from former steel workers what it was like to lace up your boots and go into the blast furnace or the hot strip mill and do a day's work. It was incredible. Just the, the smoke, the heat, the sulfur, the dust, the noise. They put me on the blast furnace the second week I was there and I almost quit. It was like fighting a fire. In the podcast series, we also travel back in time to the origins of Sparrows Point. We trace the growth of, you know, what was destined to become the largest steel mill in the world. And uh, we ask, how did this swampy peninsula on the Patapsco River end up getting picked as the site for a, a revolutionary state-of-the-art steel mill? And, uh, and by the way, what was there first? 
There was just one house on it, a house of an old ship captain, and Captain Fitzel liked his isolated spot because it reminded him of being out at sea. And they began building around 1888. From the origins of Sparrows Point, we fast forward to the mid 20th century and zoom in on the advent of unions and uh, the issue of race relations at the mill. Obviously, a unionized workforce was not part of the company's original plan. Neither was racial equity, for that matter. The fight for worker rights and for racial justice really was an uphill battle. And it was interesting just to see how they went to the Justice Department and they would lobby to make changes. So it would be two, three buses. And when you filled that room up, you would get people's attentions. And, uh, you know, in the 1970s, Bethlehem Steel was forced by federal consent decree to start hiring women in all operational departments. And uh, at Sparrows Point, uh, this brave generation of female steel workers first walked through the doors. And, and when they did, they stepped into a work environment that was honestly crass, it was sexist and oftentimes openly hostile to their presence. I can remember them hanging out of the cranes and hollering at us. And I say, who ruled this world? Girls, girls, and kept on walking. By the mid 20th century, Bethlehem Steel was the biggest steel company in the U.S. It was an industrial giant that seemed too powerful to fail. But in 2001, it declared bankruptcy decimating retirees pensions and health benefits and we take an episode in the series to dive in and examine how this empire collapsed and we we bear witness to the aftermath the world caught up to us and we did not change when i think about them steel i think about the roman empire and i think how industrial royalty became well right now it's dust in the final episode of the series we bring things up to the present day and we ask what does the story of Sparrows Point have to teach us today? What can the ghost of this now gone steel mill tell us about an uncertain economic future? When you're successful, you can't get complacent. You have to keep evolving. And if you don't, our free market system says you won't survive. And that is uh, just a quick glimpse at Sparrows Point, an American Steel story. Each episode is about 40 minutes long, and uh, they really go into some nice depth and nuance on all these critical points throughout the history of the mill. Uh, if you're a, a savvy, experienced podcaster, I can tell you, you can find the series on whatever platform you use, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. And uh, if, you're, if you're new to the whole podcast thing, you can also easily find all the episodes at the Baltimore Museum of Industry's website, thebmi.org. Thanks so much and uh, enjoy.